Please join me in a warm and enthusiastic welcome for Dr. Stephen Mansfield. Hey guys. <laughs> were, you, were you waiting the whole time for a thing to, place to eat? I'm sorry about that, man. <laughs> Starving a brother over here. How you doing? It's good to see you. Hey, I want you to know that I am so proud. By the way, adjust your seating so you can see the screen. I won't bother us if you pull up here. But I'm so proud of what Leading with Power has done. I've been here since Monday, and we've just been doing luncheons like this all over the state, and uh, dinners in the evening, and meeting with leaders. And man, I'm telling you, they're doing some serious, some serious good. I love looking out there, you know, seeing 300 guys at a lunch, and fathers and sons. Obviously, the sons skipping school, which I love. And um, so all of it's going very, very well. Great to be with you. Looking forward to talking to you. Let me just warn you a little bit that I, my southern cousins tell me uh, that I talk fast like a Yankee on drugs. So um, I'm going to be talking fast, cause, especially because I'm excited about what I'm talking about. And I know I talk a little faster than most folks up here, but just to speed up your listening device. Let me, uh, let me ask you guys uh, to look at the screen and look at the faces of the men that are in these pictures. And if I'm in your way, just wave me off. These men, previous generations of men, your ancestors lived different lives than the lives that we're living. And I think that's for a number of reasons that we need to consider today. Uh, these men, uh, first of all, would have had, for the most part, larger families than we tend to have today, just on average. Uh, you, therefore, they had brothers they grew up with, literal biological brothers they grew up with. They probably had fathers in the home. We we'll have a bit of crisis about that today. They had uncles. They had grandfathers, probably. Um, you often hear when you read history or you know, hear historians teach that people, you know, lifespans were shorter. That's because there was a lot of child infancy. But if a person survived childhood, they tended to live a fairly long time. And so often a young man would grow up, he'd have a grandfather that he knew, he'd have uncles, he'd have brothers. Uh, and that was just the immediate biological family. Then you had, uh, back in the, the earlier days, you had, call it what you will, the tribe, the village, uh, the extended family, uh, the people in the nearby farms, the people in the region. Uh, the, these people were essential. They were part of a young man's life. They were part of a, the people a man knew. They needed his skill. He needed their skills. Uh, from everything from barn raising to bringing in the harvest to hunting to defense. Um, I have this picture up here because I am Native American. We'll talk about some land you owe me later, okay? Um, but that's why this picture of the Native Americans up there, I just want to get them in there too. Think about their lives. Think about their tribal existence. Uh, they had an incredible extended family. And so men, had, men grew up in a context of men. They had a built-in culture of manhood. They had a built-in culture. They were, they were mentored. They, think about it on the frontier. Think about it through history. And I'm going to take you way back to you know, pre-Christian you know, pre times uh, here in some of these images. Um, think about how many men they had in their lives. Think about the skills that were passed down from generation to generation. Think about what, he, what you had, a young man had to learn. A young man on the western frontier in America, I mean, they were desperate to teach him how to use a gun and how to read the signs and tracking and and how to watch for the Native Americans, basically my ancestors, and you know, that kind of thing. You follow what I mean. I mean, skills had to be passed on. People had to learn things. People had, you, you, you quickly taught a young man. He was assigned a mentor. He, he was expected to learn uh, t gifts and abilities and skills, and uh, these things were essential. And there was a culture of manhood that kept the society together. And this goes, back, this goes back to ancient times. I mean, you're going to see some Roman images here. I like this particular relief, um, not just to be artsy, but because the person who carved this was actually using real Roman faces. So as you look at this, you're looking at the faces of men who actually lived at that time. And so all the way back in history, men, for the most part, had more men in their lives, more mentors, more fathering in the general sense, even if the biological father was uh, not around or dead or what have you. Um, and was, was, there was a more urgent need to mentor and to be connected and to bond together as men. In fact, survival actually depended on it throughout most of history. Well, that's far different from the lives that we're living today. It's far different. And I realize this is an exceptional group of men. Uh, I don't mean that just to compliment you. I mean, there's a little bit of pre-filtering that's happened here. You're sitting here. You're interested in manhood. Uh, you're connected up. A lot of you go to churches and you have uh, guys that you walk with today. But... I want to say that the statistics today are really quite different from what our ancestors would have known. And that's one of the things I want to talk to you about today. Uh, the average man today, the surveys tell us, cannot name a best friend. The average man in the Western world today cannot name a best friend. In fact, there's a stat that I like uh, e even more than that. I don't like it, but it's, I think it's an indicator. 
The average man, according to surveys, cannot name a friend who, if this man was out of town on a business trip, uh, he would trust to get his son out of jail if his son had been picked up, you know, three in the morning uh, by the police. Who, who would you trust to go get your son? Who would you trust to handle that delicate situation? Who would you trust with confidentiality or with skill or, 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 or the wisdom or the strength? Who would you trust with your life? I like this one even better. Uh, the average man today uh, does not know who he would call, again, if he was on a business trip, uh, to help his wife if his wife had a crisis at 3 in the morning. So picture it now. There she is flitting around the house, and she's in her nightie, you know, and maybe the dog's run off or the son's and gotten picked up for whatever, uh, you know, or the plumbing's fought, shooting water all over the house or something. Who do you trust to go over at 3 in the morning to help your wife with some situation when you're out of town? The average man today, to the tune of about 80%, can't name who that man is. And this last one is important because many of us had friends who inspired us earlier in our life. We had college buddies or military buddies or professional buddies or maybe elementary school guys who pushed us to be better or high school guys who pushed us to be better, whatever. Friends who inspired us to be better. But the average guy today has uh, reports that he has, and this is mainly an American survey, that he has no body, no other peer, no other male who's inspiring him to better himself, to improve himself, who's helping him watch out for the, uh, the flaws and the, uh, the misdeeds that he might be, be unaware of in his own life. And so that's a crisis in our society. And you know, the, the, the fact is there's a pretty common trajectory that happens for a lot of us. I mean, this is the tale of modern man. Um, many of us can look back and, you know, friends were, friendships were easy back in elementary school. Friendships were easy uh, back in high school. You know, you just show up and I mean, gosh, when you're in elementary school, just go to the playground. I mean, make, making friends is like falling off a log. High school, it's easy. You're on the sport. You're on the football team, the basketball team. You're, you know, on the yearbook committee. You're in the band, whatever you are. Uh, you know, you, you got friendships built in. It's easy. It's, it's, it's bonding. Thing, same things continue when you get to college. If you go to college, you go in the military, you go into your profession, you got guys to have a beer with after work, you got guys you hang with in the dorm, you got guys in the barracks, you know, and, and friendships are fairly easy. They're still built in. You're single, you got time, lot, you're, you're pushed together with people who are of their same basic interest. But normally, in the American and the Western kind of trajectory, that begins to change after that. A man can report having awesome friends to that point, and then, and please don't hear me blaming women. I'm the opposite of blaming women. I'm as close to a feminist as a Christian can be. Uh, but, I, uh, but I do not blame women. But when a man gets married, things begin to change. Why? Well, he's got responsibilities. He's got, he's got a primary responsibility to her. Then he's got a house of some sort, or an apartment, or something he's got to take care of, cars to clean. Kids come along. They rule our lives in a wonderful way, but they still rule our lives. And most men report that after a wife and a house and a car and a job and a you know, career and kids, they, begin, they, they realize, looking back, that they began to pull away from their friends. In fact, psychologists have a word for friendships we used to have but aren't as, aren't as vital to us these days. They call them rust friends. Rust friends are the guys who used to be, uh, you know, who were in your wedding, but you, you talked to maybe once a year. Rust friends were the guys you shot hoops with and got a beer with, you know, um, Maybe, maybe hot college or military or, you know, after work or something you worked out with or went and hunted with on a Saturday or what have you, but you haven't seen them in years. You don't know them. You call, you call them, maybe there's a text, maybe there's the occasional, you know, sending of a cartoon or something, but, but they're rust friends. And so the average guy today finds himself in his, could be as early as late 20s, normally it's in the 30s, long about 30s, 40s, certainly beyond that, and he can't name a significant male in his life. He can't, he, 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 he doesn't have, he's a wash in a sea of casual relationships. He knows a lot of guys, but he doesn't have anybody he knows at any great depth, okay? He doesn't have a best buddy to have rowdy fun with. He doesn't really have anybody who knows his life well enough to, you know, speak to him about anything that might be amiss. Uh, he's just kind of floating around, um, you know, not having a horrible life. He's living in America. He's, you know, he's free. He's probably prosperous, certainly compared to the rest of history, but there's something missing. And especially when a man begins to get a vision for what it means to be a real man, to be a noble man, to be a great man, to be an honorable man, to live out noble manhood, uh, to not just let the culture carry him into, uh, you know, manhood being about what you do sexually or what you own or, you know, how you smell or what, what product you have on your hair or, you know, 
other kinds of things society looks at, you know, kind of the GQ magazine kind of stuff. No, there's, when a man gets a vision for noble manhood, then, then he really begins to feel the lack of other men around him because he knows that somehow manhood is not a, 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 an individual sport. It's a team sport. You've got to have other people involved in your life. You've got to have other people helping you walk this thing out. A lot of times when some of us go to men's conferences or you know, seminars or meetings like this, we go away with a long list of things we think we've got to do by ourselves when we go home. But the reality is we, we, we don't have to do all those things alone. We're meant to, uh, you know, we may, we may, a lot of people laugh at Hillary Clinton's It Takes a Village when she's talking about raising a child, and I'm not playing politics here. Um, but it definitely takes a band of brothers to build men, to build noble men. And one of the things that's going wrong in our society is that because adult men don't seem to have a culture of manhood and, a, and kind of a shared networking and a, and a contagious culture, then we have nothing to bring up the boys into. We have nothing to initiate the boys into. And that's becoming a crisis in our society. There's a great African proverb that says if we do not initiate the boys, they will burn the village down. And that's a lot of what's going on in our society. Street gangs, inner city gangs, ISIS. I do a lot in the Middle East and know, actually know people in ISIS. And I'm telling you, they're not, they're not radical Muslims. They're just street thugs who got captured for, a, uh, you, you know, for, a, for a, basically a gang that says you can have sex with whoever you capture and we'll, we'll take a lot of money and you get to kill people and things like that. A bunch of unfathered, untethered, unrooted young men. So what's the solution going to be? What's the solution going to be? Well... If you are wise men, and I know you all are, then you know that every really important principle of life appears in some episode of The Andy Griffith Show, right? I mean, come on. you got, you got to be with me in this. So let's see what Barney has to tell us uh, about this whole idea of who's going to make a difference, all right? I show that. You see, I think we can get in a room like this and we can think that the kind of situations that I'm describing is going to be fixed by Superman. Somebody's going to come in. There's going to be a great speaker. There's going to be a great conference. There's going to be a great book. There's going to be a video series. There's going to be a great retreat. And don't misunderstand, I believe in all of that. Remember what I do. I box and see it in all the time and I'm writing books and doing conferences and speaking to guys like you. But I got to tell you, we got to look around at each other and realize this is not going to get fixed by somebody from the outside coming and fixing it. It's not going to get fixed by Superman. It's going to get, we are the police. I mean that in a non-military sense and a non, you know, I'm not wanting you to be martial in any way. Um, but we got to look at each other and say, look, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna change manhood in our generation, if we're gonna be the men we're meant to be, uh, we are the police. We gotta, we gotta fix this. We gotta do this together. So you've already got this booklet in your hand and the, the phrase that, that's at the title of this booklet, Band of Brothers, comes from uh, a great poem, uh, uh, ba basically a speech by William Shakespeare. There was a battle in the early 1400s, an actual historical battle between France and England. It was called the Battle of Agincourt. And uh, later, after that years after that battle, Shakespeare wrote a play about it called Henry V. Maybe you've even seen the, uh, the movie Henry V with uh, Kenneth Branagh in it. And, uh, and in, that sp in that play about this uh, famous uh, speech, or that, that about this famous battle, Shakespeare wrote a speech attributed to Henry V, and he was summarizing what, it's, what Henry V was supposed to have said. And in this, in this phenomenal thing called the Agincourt speech, by the way, uh, so much beloved by the military that, that it was spoken on D-Day. Commanders spoke it to their troops on D-Day. It it's been spoken recently in Iraq and Afghanistan by American commanders. I, I lecture at West Point, so some of these guys come back and say, yeah, I gave the entire speech before my guys went into battle, and it really fired them up. But the phrase that we're stealing from here is, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. We band of brothers. It's a phrase that has lived in history. It's a phrase that really galvanizes what a man's looking for in his relationships. In fact, it was so significant that in our original national anthem here in the U.S., the phrase band of brothers appeared. And then they, then they shifted to another national anthem by Francis Scott Key. So that's why we titled the book this, thing, this way, and I'm, I'm so grateful to Thrivent that they're making it available to each one of you. But uh, basically, it's a blueprint for how you can be intentional in building your band of brothers. We, we're living in an age, we're living in a culture, we're living in a society where it's not going to happen by accident. 
if you let things drift along, if you things, let things just happen the way they naturally happen, uh, what will occur is that you'll eventually drift into rust relationships and find yourself in the condition that I was describing earlier. And I don't think that the great noble manhood is really possible where men don't have other men in their lives. It's essential that you have men who get you, who understand you, who can see you from 3D, and, uh, and who can help you. And you need a band to build a band of brothers around you. So since our time is, you know, I don't want to go past our time, let me take you to some steps for building your band of brothers. My whole point here today is that you've got to be intentional in building your band of brothers, that it's not going to happen by accident, unless you're very, very fortunate. Maybe you've got six biological brothers, and they're the most awesome guys in the world, and, and you know, you are you know, a six-man basketball team all by yourself, and, and, and things are awesome. Most of us, though, are swimming in a sea of casual relationships, and we've got to learn how to be intentional uh, about how to build a band of brothers. And that's what I want to talk to you about, even though the rest of it uh, is in this book. One of my favorite uh, commentators on, on, on current social trends is a woman, a, a, a secular scholar by the name of Camille Paglia. The G in her name is silent. And she wrote once a whole book about uh, manhood and womanhood, and she said a woman simply is, uh, but a man must become. Now, what is she talking about? She, she believes that women largely become women through the biological changes in their bodies. You know, you've got daughters, you've got wives, you, you have sisters, you know what I'm talking about. Women change biologically, and yeah, they need to be mentored and taught character and what have you, but for the most part, they emerge towards womanhood by the biological changes in their bodies, but not so with men. Masculinity is risky and elusive. And it's confirmed only by other men. It's other men who call manhood out of you. It's other men who say, well, that's not what a man would do. It's other men who do like what I was describing in history and teach from generation to generation, not just the skills of manhood, using a saw, you know, using a gun, what have you, uh, but also the character, the lore of manhood that's so vital. So uh, that's what I want to talk to you about, how to build a band of brothers. Let's talk about number one. Number one is the art of the indirect connection. We're basically doing it now. About the last thing any man wants to do is to be asked to go to a meeting where a bunch of chairs are circled up and somebody leans in and says, Joe, tell me how you're feeling today. <laughs> Joe, just dredge up your most embarrassing, painful memory and tell us all about it. It's okay if you cry, Joe. In fact, that would really be awesome. Most of us have some pretty strong language for that kind of experience, right? Come on, let's be honest. That's the last thing any man needs. What we need is the indirect connection. Men bond best when they're doing other things while they're getting to know each other, okay? Um, it's, it's why some of you are closest to the guys that you served with in the military or on your football team or on your basketball team or, or when you made that hunting trip that almost went bad and when we got ourselves out of it and we've been close ever since. You know what I'm talking about. It's, it's, it's while you're doing other stuff. We got to learn the art of the indirect connection. Even the shyest guy in this room, the least for, you know, some of you guys are just like, hey, party at my house as soon as somebody walks in the door. And some of you are a bit more introvert and a bit more shy. It's fine. Everybody can master the art of the indirect connection. They do studies where they put little girls and little boys in rooms separately, and then the, the, the observers, the scientists, are out around watching through two way mirrors. Uh, and so when they put the little girls in there, inevitably, the little girls will take chairs that they have been told they can move anywhere they want, and they will move the chairs facing each other. And eventually, the, the girls will stare at each other for a while, and finally one of the little girls will say, I like your hair, you know, she has a cute dress. That's about all it takes. They are best friends forever. And you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. You, some of your wives can make best friends in the time it takes to check out at the grocery store, right? They see another woman, there's a hat, there's a pen, there's a bag, there's something that needs to be, that, that they like, they compliment it, they're off having coffee within two days. I mean, it's just how it goes. Men, however, are still suspicious of criminal activity, okay? The men are not sure that they want to bond with anybody who's anywhere near them. What the little boys do is the little boys turn the chairs side by side, shoulder to shoulder sit there and look around the room. And you know how it goes. Finally, one of them will say, I bet I can beat you to that tree. I bet we can go beat up Tommy over there in no time. I bet that door will burn if we set it on fire. I mean, you know how it goes, right? I bet we can blow up the dog with some fireworks. I mean, you, you know, all of you, we could go on for hours about all this kind of thing. So the art, the beginning 
of taking relationships in your life that are casual and moving them towards meaningful relationships, moving them towards uh, you know, something more significant, which all of us need. And I'm not suggesting that you force men into some intimacy with you. That just gets weird for all of us. But you know what I'm talking about. We have men in our lives. Many of them are interested in the same things we are. We just don't tend to get past the, 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 male, the male barrier, you know? But the indirect connection, the, the, the game party, the basketball, the shooting the hoops and getting the beer afterwards, the, the sacrificing some animals, taking the trip, coming over and you know, messing around with whatever. You know, we're, uh, they're all in some kind of indirect connection. That's what we're doing right now. Food has to always be served. Animals have to always die. Okay, that always there has to be a sacrifice. With the young, it can be a drum circle. It can be a, mu hey, we're going to come over and jam or whatever. The point is, don't, what we don't want to do is start gathering up the men in our lives and saying, come over, we want to talk about our sexual lives together in the room, just us men in a circle staring at each other. <laughs> not going to happen. I mean, I, I do this semi-professionally. I'm not coming. <laughs> I'm just telling you. I'm not coming to that. Forget that. I'll come over and, and you know, eat some dead animal. I'll, I'll come over and do that. I'll come over and watch the game. Uh, I'm happy to watch over, come, the, come over and uh, watch the Redskins whoop the Packers anytime you want. I'm just, I'm just, I'm a chaplain for the Redskins. You've got to leave me alone, okay? But, uh, but the indirect connection, please remember that. Every man in the room has the ability to pull guys together for something fun, and that's how you start getting to know each other. Men check each other out far more when they're doing something else uh, than when they're trying to connect with each other. So don't push it too hard. Don't jam it too hard. Don't, don't get too much in other guys' faces. Just relax. Have fun. Pour something with suds. Talk to each other. Just watch the game. You know, do something else. Uh, that's, that's the beginning of it all. Uh, the second thing is the extension of honor. Okay, the extension of honor. What do I mean by that? What starts to change a relationship that, you, that you're already in with guys that maybe come about through a bunch of indirect connections uh, is that you start to identify the stuff in another man's life that, that you see as valuable and that and you might need some help in. I, I love the story in the Bible where David has just come back from whooping up on Goliath. And Jonathan, the son of the king, it says that D Jonathan saw him, became one in spirit with him, and loved him as himself and made covenant with him. In other words, he saw what was good about David, he saw the spirit on the man, he connected with that spirit, and he approached him and began to love him as a brother and began to make covenant with him. I, I, I like that. I have a band of brothers. I won't tell you too much about them today. Uh, they're great guys. Some of them are great big ex-NFL guys, uh, just because, again, I I'm work with, closely with the Redskins, so a couple of my guys are hall, ex-Hall of Famer linemen, big, far bigger than me, and we've got other guys in that group. And, um, and, and a lot of the, what, what moved us to another level was when I, I saw things they needed or they saw things I needed. I saw things I needed in their life. They saw things in my life they needed. And we started honoring uh, what, what gifts and abilities each other had and began to enlist help, you know? And, and so some of these guys are workout hounds, and they, you know, they're like 300 pounds with a six-pack Al. I mean, it's unbelievable. One of, one of these guys can bench press 550 pounds, and, and it's just stunning. And uh, I was with Tony Zach uh, up in La Crosse. You know, he's one of the leaders of, uh, of Leading with Power. Tony gets up at 5.30 every morning uh, to go, go do basically a boot camp workout at 5.30 in the morning. At 5.30 in the morning, I'm on my second nap. You understand how that goes? It's just, I'm just not, I'm not working out that way. So if I was with, with him and hanging with him, I, I'd say, man, I, I just admire the way you worked out and how devoted you are to that. The guy can bench press three times his body weight. I mean, I'd like to be able to do all of that. Can you help me? Can you, can, can, you know, teach me a little bit about how you got to that point? It's just an extension of honor. It's honoring what you see in a guy's life and starting to pull in something that's mutually beneficial. I guess I could teach him some Latin or something. I don't know what he'd need from me, but still, that's how it goes. Then, there's a covenant transition. In men's relationships, there's often a covenant transition. One of my guys uh, is really good at accounting and investing, and another one of my guys, as I say, is really good at uh, workout. And these two guys eventually came to a point where they said, look, I'll tell you what, I've, they'd honored each other, they'd identify the gifts in each other's lives, and they said, man, we, if you'll help me, I'll help you. Let's help each other. I'll help you be a better at workout. You help me. Uh, do, it, do some investing because some of these NFL guys had lots of money and were just idiots with it. So uh, they, they began to make a covenant transition. A covenant transition happened when two guys said, we're going to help each other. We're going to help improve each other. We're going to make an agreement to help each other. It doesn't have to last a lifetime. It's not some kind of you know, contract you sign. It's just two guys agreeing that their relationship is not just going to be about fun. It should always be about fun. There should always be smack talk. Animals should always die. Okay, <laughs> But it should also be 
be uh, if you're going to move towards what we're talking about with the Band of Brothers, where there's a covenant transition. I need your help, you need my help, or maybe I need your help and you need Joe's help, but still, there's going to be a covenant transition. That's an important transition. That's when a man starts to improve. That, that's when a man realizes what another man has to impart into his life. That's when a man uh, begins to take what he's good at and make it available to other guys he trusts and knows and is close to so that both can, can improve and can, and can become what they're made to be. Make me better. Make me better. And when all of that begins to happen, you move to this. And I'm a huge believer in this, the free fire zone. Now, those of you who are ex-military or maybe current military, you know the free fire zone is something else. It has to do with the rules of engagement on a battlefield. But in the context I'm talking about here, a free fire zone is where we have an agreement that anything that needs to be said to make me better and anything that needs to be said to make any of our guys better does get said respectfully, lovingly, but we help, we sharp, we're steel sharpening steel. We help each other become better. And I got to tell you, this, this arrangement has changed my life. You know, the problem with men for the most part amongst all other things, is that we got these weird cultural situations. Down south, why I would never hurt his feelings by speaking to him of what is wrong in his life, right? We're all too polite and we're all too hesitant. And out west, we're all supposed to be the Mar Marlboro man and we're all supposed to be too rugged, you know, to actually uh, speak of any personal thing. And up north, we're all supposed to be cold-hearted Yankees, you know, who don't care about uh, personal things and don't want to talk about those things. And I don't know what you deal with here in this part of the world, you know, with the, maybe it's a Germanic background or maybe it's a certain thing about the trays or what have you, but there's always something in a culture that keeps men from really connecting. And what's got to happen is that men have got to push past that and work towards accomplishing a free fire zone. Not too long ago, uh, I was at a party, and uh, somebody snapped a picture while I was there, and later they showed me that picture. And, and, I, and he handed me the picture, and I said, who's that? And he looked at me and said, it's you, fool. It was the ugliest picture ever taken of a human being in all of history, okay? I, I, don't laugh at me now, I had, I had a white t-shirt on, it was stretched over my belly, right? I was sitting on a couch, so I was looking like I had more of a belly than I actually have. My head was jammed down because I was sitting on this couch into my shoulders, so I looked like I had about 92 chins, okay? I had, the picture was overexposed, so I was all white and pasty. I, I was halfway through a blink, and you know what that makes you look like? Makes you look like you're drunk. Well, I hadn't had anything, but I, uh, you know, like I was going to get arrested. And then, I think I had about 16 Oreos in my mouth. So I looked like Jabba the Hutt on a bad day, okay? And I got to thinking, if I can look that way, I mean, literally, I didn't think I could ever look that bad. Uh, I didn't think I could ever even look that way, even if it hadn't been bad. The fact is that I can look that way, and other people knew it. Other people could see it. I mean, they didn't take the picture for that reason, but I mean, it was, my friends certainly said, when I showed it to them, they said, oh, yeah, you look like that sometimes. I'm like, why didn't you tell me? That's so terrible. Well, if it can happen like that externally, what, what's going on with me inside that I don't know? See, we need the eyes of other men who care about us and aren't afraid of us to help us become better. We need the eyes of other men who care about us and want us to become better. Here's the, here's the, here's the false version of this. And if I, if I step on some toes, just forgive me. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do you some good. In, in, in a lot of our, our world, when it comes to men's stuff, there's a thing called an accountability group. And I think an accountability group is a false step towards the free fire zone and a band of brothers. Because an accountability group usually means that I'm supposed to figure out what's wrong with me, hang on to that knowledge for a couple of weeks, drive over to the breakfast spot, and over steak and eggs or biscuits and gravy or whatever, I'm supposed to tell a bunch of guys I don't see very often what's wrong with me so that they can give me some advice and maybe pray for me. Well, I guess that's, that's, that's not bad. It's, it's okay, but it's not everything that I need. Because if you're waiting for me to figure out what's wrong with me, we're screwed, okay? If you're waiting for me to have the courage to hang on to that knowledge for two weeks and take it to some guys I don't see very often, we're screwed. If you're waiting for me to tell, tell you that story rather than the victory I had last week, that we're screwed. You follow what I'm saying? Everything's working against us. Gentlemen, what I need are men I'm doing life with. I need men who are walking closely enough with me to know my life without me having to describe it to them. I need men who know, who can recognize that I've taken the second or the third look at the back, back side of the waitress and ask me what's going on at home. I need guys who know that my problem is not cocaine or anything else I might snort up my nose, that if, that if, that if uh, somebody says Mansfield's doing a line, it's a line of Oreos, okay? 
don't laugh at me, you guys that got the same addiction, we're going to have an intervention here in just a minute. That's why they put Oreos in rows in the bag, so that I can snort them up as fast as humanly possible, okay? My guys know that my problem is not women and booze. My problem is that I can put away a bag of Oreos and nine or ten Snickers along the way. I can eat too much, right? Especially when I'm hanging with Keith. It's just an addiction. And so uh, my guys know that my, my problem is not what you might think. My problem can be bitterness, or my problem can be dropping the F-bomb when I shouldn't. Or my, you know, my guys know what's wrong with me, what the deal is. They hear the angry phone call with my wife and go, what's going on at home? I don't have any special problems, and being a band of brothers is not about guarding against some evil that looms at the door. It's about helping a man be his best. But you've got to know him, you've got to be able to see him 3D so he can become what he's called to be, what he's made to be. I don't want him to interpret it for me. I don't want him to have to figure it out and tell me. He'll probably get it wrong. I, I need to be able to see him. I need to be able to walk with him. I need to be able to, uh, to, 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 to have us each see each other's lives and, and encourage each other to be better. And I've got to tell you, since I know a lot of you guys are in business, that what I'm finding happen, and what I see happen all over this country with guys who are forming a band of brothers, is, um, is actually having a huge impact, not just on their lives as fathers and husbands and, and, and you know, church members or, or buddies, but it's also changing them in business. Because the same things that are hindering you and causing you problems at home are causing you problems at the business. There's, there's no question about it. One of, my band, one of my guys in my band looked at me one time and he said, you know, I never feel as unimportant as I do in your presence. Well, I was stunned. I've been a leader of a lot of organizations by then and done a lot of things. Why in the world would that be true? And when we really drilled down to it, and I was so glad he said something, I have kind of a, it's actually a Cherokee habit, of looking up and looking away when I'm thinking about something. Well, he's sitting here telling me something about his life. And so what, what's my body language saying? My body language is saying I'm not interested because I'm, I'm going, huh. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm engaged. But, but I've got to learn some, some principles about how human beings function, learn to turn towards him and focus on him so he feels like I'm actually connected. I am connected. I do care about him, but I'm not sending that signal to him. I can't tell you how just that complaint, well, he had a glass of wine in one hand and a steak in the other, and he just said, he said, dude, I'd never feel as unimportant as I do when I'm in your presence. And it just blew me. It, just, I mean, it almost reduced me to tears right there in the room, but it's made me a better leader, and it's, and it's, it's made me a better man up on the public stage, so to speak. Um, and not just, uh, and also made me a better father, better husband. I mean, who knows what I was doing to my wife, my kids. I cared about them. I loved them, but I wasn't engaging. So these, these, this, this, this issue of building a free fire zone, being with some guys where everything that needs to be said to make us better, to make us the kind of men we want to be, to address whatever it is, dropping the F-bomb, bad grammar. It's not, a, an, not an opportunity to beat on a guy. It's an opportunity to hold up a mirror and help him be better and then be committed to helping him be better. The guy who um, encourages our group to work out more shows up at our house at 6 o'clock. And he's about, he's about 6'5", 300 pounds. When he comes to your house to take you for a run, you go. I'm just telling you, you go. You don't, you don't resist, all right? <laughs> what you're trying to build here is a contagious culture. You're trying to build a contagious culture of inspiration, of achievement, of confrontation, of loving confrontation. Don't be afraid of the word confrontation. I assume all of you who don't live in this hotel drove here in a car, right? You, you got here by a series of small explosions. That's what an engine is. Well, if we don't have small explosions in our lives, small confrontations, we're going to have gigantic ones. If you're not having a kind of relationship with your spouse where she can uh, you know, tell you what's wrong, bring a complaint, have a problem dealt with at the low level, if those things aren't happening, it's just going to build up and build up and build up until you have the massive explosions that can be life damaging. So a series of small explosions is actually part of healthy relationships, is what people ought to have. You want to have those. I love that my band of brothers watches me, checks on me, keeps me humble, loves me, inspires me, but keeps an eye on, on what's wrong with me. I assure you that while I've been here this week, I showed up Monday, one of my guys has called, checked on me, how you doing? Now, he's not, he's not worried that I'm going to flip out or go crazy. I mean, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a committed, I'm a guy committed to an ethical code. I'm not misbehaving in any way. But he is going to ask me, how many Oreos have you had? He is going to ask me that. How's the eating going? He'll ask me that just in passing. It's not like, okay, brother, sit down, stare in the mirror, and let me ask you, how much food have you had? That's, not, that's just silly. That's just stupid. No, it's all in passing. You're doing okay? Everything okay? You're not bitter? You're not overly tired? You didn't flip by some HBO porn on the TV and get hooked by it? You know, he, I mean, we live in the real world. We all know what reaches to a man's soul, you know? And so, uh, so he asked me about this. It's a contagious culture of manhood 
And what we, what, what's great about it is that then we have something to bring up the young men in because that's one of the great crises. Let me ask you to listen to the words and there's certain movies you're not going to go to heaven without and um, you've got to watch them or you don't go. And one of them is Seabiscuit, okay? One of them is Seabiscuit. You have to watch all the Andy Griffith shows too. And at the very end of Seabiscuit, there's something that's said that describes pretty much what I'm talking about here. You know, everybody thinks we found this broken down horse and fixed him, but we didn't. He fixed us. Every one of us. And I guess in a way, we kind of fixed each other too. Now, I love those words because, of course, the great cause to which these men are committed is this amazing horse in the 1930s called Seabiscuit. Seabiscuit got more press inches than American newspapers than Hitler did. And uh, one of you know, if you've seen the movie, you get a sense of how major it was. The guys who came around him, who trained him and took him on, on the, race, you know, the racing circuit and won so many accolades were some pretty broken human beings. But as they were committed to this cause and committed to each other and committed to victory, they, as this, just this, this narrative says, they fixed each other. That's actually a quote from a journal of one of the guys who was involved. So they fixed each other. And, and that's, that's what I believe with all my heart. I believe that we are meant to help each other. I think that what's lacking most in the lives of men, once they gain a vision for noble manhood, um, is that they have, do not have other men engaged in helping them. They expect it to come from a conference, or, and I, please understand, I'm, I'm com radically committed to church. I'm not one of these guys who's critical of church. I'm actually a member of two churches, one in D.C. and one in Nashville, so I'm definitely going to heaven. Uh, but, <laughs> but my point is, I'm not down on church, but, but we wait for a conference, or we wait for the pastor to preach on it once every three years, or whatever it is, you know, that's not enough. We've got to have men actively in our lives, and we've got to fix each other. I really believe that's important. So let me ask you to ponder this for just a moment as I'm coming to, a, to an end here and let you guys get back to your day. Do you have a band of brothers? Do you have men with whom you have a free fire zone? Do you have men walking closely enough with you to know, yeah, sure, what's wrong with you, but, but more importantly, what's good about you, and, and accentuate it? This is not a bunch of guardians that we're hiring to make sure we behave ourselves like, you know, you're going to get stoned between here and the office or the men's room. That's not what we're, that's not what we're worried about. We want to be better. We're wanting to not let the stuff we don't see about ourselves, you know, dominate our lives. We're wanting to be inspired. We're wanting to be nurtured. We're wanting to be, be helped to be better. Every man in here has got great genius in him. And every man in here, in here, in the same soil in which the seeds of his greatness exist, also are also the weeds that can destroy his life. We want to weed the one. We want to encourage the other and feed the other. And you can't do that alone. It's a team sport. It's a team sport. And let me close with this thought before I show you another video clip, and video clip and make a few more final comments, and then I'll maybe make nine or ten more, and then we'll just stay here for a while. Uh, I want to make sure that you understand that I, I've not been, I've been hiding the fact that I'm a Christian, and I'm not trying to force you into anything if you're not, but I believe that it's God who made manhood, God who made men to be the way they are. I love it in the Bible when God shows up in, in a couple of circumstances, and he turns to someone and says, prepare to defend yourself like a man. And he's not, in the, in the Hebrew that's used there, it's not, it's not prepared to defend yourself like a male. That would be unnecessary. Nobody has to tell you guys to be males. Um, but it's prepare you to defend, to defend yourself in the way of a man, in the lore of a man, in the, in the manner of a man, in the way that a man should be. I think God designed all this. I think God designed the strength of a man. I think God designed uh, the uniqueness of a man, the power of a man. Uh, I think God designed those things. And so I, need, I want him to be involved, working through my band of brothers, but also directly on me by his spirit, to help me become the man that I'm meant to be. Uh, I, 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 like all of you, have had wonderful, manly, propulsion kinds of experiences, and then I've had a lot of things that damaged me as a man. I grew up in Europe, for example, where turning on the TV at 3 in the afternoon as a 14-year-old, you saw full-on porn uh, there in what they called soap operas, uh, like our soap operas, but theirs were, you know, full-on porn. So there I am at 14 years old, watching the TV, seeing porn that, you know, you don't even see on U.S. TV, even to this day, like that. Uh, damaged me. Damaged me. Um, I had wacko friends who tried to get me into strange stuff, and even if I didn't go, I still didn't have any positive models. I had a father who was a war hero and a, and a brilliant military officer, but wasn't that great a father at home. 
Uh, we became closer later in life. So I had, like many of you, great experiences as a man, and then I had experiences that were damaging to me as a man. We need to get fixed. I need, I need, to be, I need help. I need guys to identify that. I need guys to know the damage. And I need the Lord to restore me to my life as a, a good and a righteous man. That's what leading with power is all about, and that's what, that's what we're here talking about. And the good news for you is if you've been trying to do it alone and you've really felt like a failure in it, it's okay. You don't have to do it alone. Build a band of brothers. Build a band of brothers. And so what I want you to experience um, is what's mentioned in another movie you won't go to heaven without, and that's Chariots of Fire. I hope you've seen this movie. And in that movie, the actor who is playing Eric Little, who is an Olympic champion in the 1920s, and by the way, he, Little actually said these words, um, explains that when he runs, he feels God's pleasure. That's what I want for you as you pursue noble manhood. Listen to these words. Jenny. Jenny, you've got to understand. I believe that God made me for a purpose, for China. But he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. So what I'm hoping for you, as you continue with leading with power, as you invest in each other's lives, as you know each other, uh, is that you will pursue noble manhood together, that you'll read this little booklet, other books, books like it, great literature out there, that you'll connect with guys through leading with power, and that you'll become the great man you're meant to be. Um, I want you to go build, but I want you to feel God's pleasure as you do. Listen to me now. Every man is fighting a great battle of some kind. The purpose of a band of brothers is that you join him in that battle and enlist him or the others in helping you fight the great battles of your life so you can become the great man you're called to be. Proud of you guys being here. It's an honor to be with you. God bless you. We have an opportunity to ask a question or two. If, if any question comes to mind, just start your brain thinking about a question. And I guess I have one. Your first book you ever wrote um, was about an individual um, tell me a little bit about, uh, in that first book you wrote, why you chose the subject matter you did and maybe one story out of it that was inspiring for us all. Yeah, my first book, I appreciate you asking that, my first book was about Winston Churchill. And um, I wrote about him because when I began to read about Winston Churchill, I saw about a, a, a story of a man. We all know the public Churchill, the guy with the cigar and the hats and the great speeches and all that stuff, Prime Minister of England who pretty much helped rescue the Western world from Nazism. But what I, uh, what I saw as I read a lot about him as a student of history in college is that uh, Churchill was a man who could have easily been crushed by the things that happened in his life. I mean, he was born excessively overweight. His father hated him. I don't know if you know that his father hated him every day of his life. They, his parents packed him off to what we would call private schools. And there are entire books today of the compilations of little, little Winston's letters writing his parents saying, please come visit me. Please don't abandon me. And his father would make a speech right next door to his school and not go see his son when he hadn't seen his son in maybe the better part of a year. Um, Churchill, because of this kind of treatment, suffered horribly throughout his life from black dog depressions. In fact, when he was uh, prime minister of England and visiting Franklin Roosevelt at the White House, he would not stay in a room with a balcony on it because he was afraid a depression would hit and he would throw himself off and kill himself. He was one of the leaders of the Western world at the time. Uh, he was in debt every day of his adult life, he had a troubled marriage. Uh, you know, one of, his, one of his kids committed suicide, two drank themselves to death, he had a daughter die in infancy. I mean, you know, the guy suffered. But still, he overcame and learned the lessons in the dark night of his soul uh, to become a, a great leader. All the surveys say he was the greatest leader of the last century. So um, I write biographies about famous leaders that everybody knows, but I like writing stories about those leaders that people don't know. And that's what I did, for example, in Mansfield's book of Manly Men. I write about Lincoln, but I write about his, how he almost killed himself because he was so depressed. Uh, I, I write about others, you know, but I write about the dark side of their story. Theodore Roosevelt lost his mother and his wife in the same house on the same day from the same disease and almost never recovered from it, but went on later to become the great man we know now. But he had to farm that valley first. So that's why I wrote those things. Thanks for asking. Yeah, thank you. And it's just twelve ninety nine. It's on Amazon. Just quit. No, <laughs> just playing. Other questions uh, for this opportunity? Yeah, let me pull the mic over here. Do you have a selection process for guys? I can think of. Um, I moved to Madison six years ago, and I had like uh, we had like fourteen of us that all kind of moved there at the same time, and we all kind of hung out. 
and that became like a really wonderful brotherhood. And over the years, it kind of just got smaller and smaller, but actually kind of felt refined. Uh, and now, like kind of six years later, like none of us hang out, <laughs> like none of us. And uh, you know, it's hard to hard to rekindle those relationships. And so I'm kind of starting new. Yeah. So how do you know like who to reinvest in? How do you know like who to like kind of bring back these rusty friends? And how do you know you know I need to make something new? Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I can tell you what, what we do. Every, everything that's valuable is, it has life grows, and, and, it, and it, uh, it, it's got to expand. So you were, you were, and I'm not criticizing, you had a group of guys, and you were really trying to do it permanently with them. What probably needed to happen is you bring in flesh, fresh blood, new people, you know, and then it, and the guys are going to rotate out. People are going to move. A lot of the people I speak to and hang with and try to help are in the military, and they're moving every year or two, and so they're starting a new band of brothers at every new post. And so... Don't be nervous if the, the season for a, a given group or band of brothers or one of the guys in the band of brothers just comes to an end. You know, it's just a change. Life changes. Needs change. Personalities change. You know, um, it's not, it, there's not one pattern, number one. But number two, it doesn't necessarily have to be in that same configuration forever. In fact, if you've got the same guys who meet year after year after year, I'm concerned they have more of a stake club than they have a real band of brothers. Bring in the new guy. Bring in the troubled guy so they can help him. Uh, you know, expand, grow, morph, increase, you know. Um, let the skills of new people challenge you, you know. Otherwise, everybody's sitting around fat and happy and going, well, nothing wrong with you. Awesome. Let's go eat, you know, kind of thing, rather than seeing what's really of need. So I commend you for having a band of brothers. I understand the grief of losing the guys you once walked with. Don't feel like you have to draw those same guys back, you know. Uh, ask, ask God if you believe that way. I, I do. That's why I talk about it. I'm not trying to sh jam faith out anybody's throat. Watch your life, watch your relationships, see who you can sort of, you know, begin to have the indirect connection with and move down the progression that I've talked about. But part of what I wanted to tell you is good news. Some of what you're dealing with is normal. Yeah. Everything morphs, everything changes, seasons happen in people's lives. Um, I don't want to hang with the nitwits I'm hanging now with forever. I mean, come on. I, I even tell them that. Why don't you guys move away or something so I can have some other, you know, just, we're just having fun. But I know it's painful, but don't sweat it. If you're hungry for it, keep an eye out for those in your life. You'll bring a new band around. And the other guys will drift back when they find out something cool is happening if they're supposed to be connected with you, you know? If they're not with you, they can't, they can't leave. And if, they're not, if, they are, if they are with you, they can't leave. And they aren't with you, they can't stay, you know? So just relax that there's a natural rhythm to all of that, okay? Great question. Other questions? Yes. Time for one more question after this. All right, better be an awesome question, that last question. Wow, the pressure's amazing. on here. Yeah. Let's uh, see what I can come up with. Um, you deal with perception all the time. And for something like this to happen, it takes time. If I spend five hours on a golf course with some guys, then I'm at home saying, well, you just spend five hours on a golf course. And it's always perceived as you're robbing family, you're robbing marriage, you're robbing the kids, so you could have time on your own. How do you, how do you address that? Well, I don't play golf because I already have a religion. Um, I don't really. Uh, you know, I think the, the, the issue is that it's a trade-off. If my wife, if her cup is full throughout the week, then what I do on Saturday has not got the big focus to it. You know what I mean? If, I, if, I, if I'm going to go do whatever, you know, play racquetball or hike or whatever, I, whatever it is I like to do on a Saturday, I'm not, not going to be with my wife. If she's, if she's felt, had my attention, my, my investment, uh, all through the week or previous weeks or whatever, she's not going to sweat just what I do on a Saturday afternoon. Usually, there's a lot of heat scrutiny on what a man does on a weekend because there hadn't been much going on otherwise. So uh, I think, I, I believe in being very intentional in almost negotiating these things. My wife and I, uh, we're, she's an executive, she's very busy, I'm busy. So we have, we have weekends we get away, we have nights we, we date, we, we agree to touch base with each other constantly. We, we agree to nights that whatever else we're doing doesn't go past 8 o'clock, you know, that kind of stuff. We negotiate it. And I'm not saying that we don't love each other, so we have to be practical and, you know, lawyer-like. Um, I'm just saying that that's how we protect our relationship. So my, su my suggestion is that you, you know, if you really love golf, great, but, but realize there's a trade-off to be made uh, in, in time and in those relationships. Look at your kids, look at your grandkids, look at your uh, relationship with your wife and say, you know, am I, am I prioritizing those investments to the fulfillment of that individual? And, and make the trade-off. Nothing wrong with golf on a Saturday afternoon. For heaven's sakes, man needs that. But there are other things that he's got to be willing to make the investment with. I, just, I think the main issue is that it's intentional and that we're not just letting our lives drift into neglect of, of things that are important for us. Do yourself a favor, love your wife. Do yourself a favor, love your wife, okay? 
Good advice there. All right, one more. One more question. Josh, you can come on up too. One more question. Anybody have it? Come on, there's got to be an All right, awesome. Josh is going to do some. Uh, you, if you had it, you can raise right. your hand. Uh, yeah, there you go. Wait for the mic, will you, bud? I guess all of us guys um, deal with, uh, you know, we don't want to show weakness. And um, bringing out the best in each other, you talked about certain things, but just bringing out that vulnerable side in other guys and getting to a deeper level, just not, you know, hanging out on the surface and uh, things like that, but really getting to the core of, you know, um, sharing more um, in your life, I guess, just breaking down those walls to get more vulnerable with other guys. Yeah, I don't, I don't try to get anybody else to be vulnerable. I just lead the way. I'll say, guys, I'm, I'm having a hard time. I am ticked at my wife over something. Have you guys ever had this situation? And you just draw them out. If you step up into it first. Uh, every guy in here is a genius at something, like I say, and every guy in here is a nitwit at some things. Okay, come on. We just have to own our nitwitness, right? Um, everybody's brilliant at something, and when they're in that mode, they just look like the greatest thing on the planet, and, ev and everybody else at other times is just a fool. And so what I do is I just lead the way in being transparent. Um, it's, it's not, and, and remember that a band of brothers is not primarily about, you know, disgorging whatever's wrong with you. Um, but yeah, part of it is that you're just able to step up and say, I need your help. And I think that, 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 uh, that extending of honor and covenant transition level is saying, dude, I'm, I'm like the laziest thing in the world, man. You're getting up and working out. You got to help me. I just, I just need your help. I'm terrible at that. Or, you know, I just, I, you know, I had a guy looked at me one day and said, I love the F word. I'm telling you, I love the F word. I can't ask for somebody to pass the salt without saying the F word, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I think I can help because I don't have, you know, I'm kind of a professional language guy, you know? And so I think I can maybe help you with that. Let's find another word, you know, or whatever. I don't know what the, you know, <laughs> you move down the ladder of cuss words that become socially acceptable or whatever, you know? What are you watching that's got you wanting to say the F word at breakfast? Um, so... I think, I think the issue is you can't really guarantee, uh, you can't insist on transparency from other men, quite frankly, we'll shut down if you do that, but you can step up to, up to it on your own, you know? I mean, in one sentence, a guy could say, you know, my father used to beat the hell out of me, uh, or he sexually abused me, or my mother left, my, my parents both left when, they were, when I was three, and so I have, I've had a hard time with these things. It doesn't have to be something long and 50 miles long. It just can be a, a few moments of transparency. You guys ever dealt with anything like that? Anybody else have that kind of stuff? You know? And it feels manly, and you know, if you've got your mouth full of something good to eat and animals have died, then you know, it's, it's, a, it's a man moment rather than, bro, really? Would you hold me? You know, that, I mean, you just get, it's not going to happen. So I'm not picking on it. I'm just saying, you know, there's a way to do it. There's an art to it. And I think the way you, 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 you help that is to go, to go to another level. Now, I do want to say that in our group, if you want to get pounded by a former NFL lineman, break the confidentiality of our band of brothers. You know what I'm saying? What happens in the band of brothers stays in the band of brothers unless it's a threat to somebody in, in his family. You follow what I'm saying? If some guy says I'm... Uh, every night I clean my gun and think about killing my wife. Well, we're going to intervene. We've done that before. We had a guy commit uh, years ago who lied to us, and, and I'll tell you the story real quick because it's kind of kind of funny. He lied to us and he had an affair, and he was one of the pro NFL guys, and he had a house out in Colorado. So as soon as he realized it was public, he flew out to his house in Colorado. Well, I was at my office, and here came an SUV with all the other guys in there. They said, "Come on, we're going. We're going to go find this fool." So we flew out to Colorado, and we got an SUV, and the other NFL guy jumped out of the car when we got up to this guy's million, you know, multi-million dollar home. And I realized that if I didn't get ahead of him, that somebody was going to die because he was mad. He was heading in to find this sucker. And I didn't get ahead of him. And he kicked the door in. I'm talking about a door went flying into the, whatever, the entryway. And he went up there and I thought, now I've got to grab him or he's going to kill this guy. And before I could get a hold of him, I'm pretty, you know, able to hold a guy. Um, he had this guy pinned on the ground. You lied to us, you lying sack, I'm going to pound your ass right, you know, that, that kind of, I mean, you know, it wasn't, that, wasn't the holiest moment in his life, but it was definitely an effective <laughs> moment. We kept that guy locked away for th five days out there at that house. We all took time off. We, you know, whooped on him and he lied to us and tell us, we made him tell us all the details. And then what, to put it in brief, we just, we called the wife and said, are you willing to work this through? She said, I don't trust him, but I do trust you guys. See what happened? He trusted the band of brothers. She trusted the band of brothers. She didn't trust him. It was my job to meet with the kids and pizza and long walks and helping them heal. Somebody else, other guys worked with the wife and got counselors and all that. That family's together to this day. Uh, but it's because, you know, so my point is that, you know, you've got to keep confidentiality. You've got to be tough with each other. In the booklet, I talk about the brotherhood of the fierce. If you're going to be in my band of brothers, I'm going to be fierce in pursuing you for wholeness and 
to accomplish what you, you know. So we created an environment which, you know, you better out with it, you know, and we're all fools, so I'll go, he lying, you're not telling us half of what's really going on there, you know, that kind of stuff. We'll talk that way. And so once you create a culture like that, you're in good shape. Love you guys. Big round of applause, Dr. Stephen Mansfield. Thank you very much. A few closing things. I'm actually leaving right after this to go uh, hiking in Colorado, and one of my band of brothers is back there. So 14 hours of talking about our feelings, Adam. That's what it's going to be. You can't go anywhere. A couple things. Um, if you have comment cards in front of you, please fill them out if you wish. You don't have to write your name at the bottom. We don't know, necessarily know who you are. We're just trying to improve on this. I mean, this is our first time doing this, though we're following it in the footsteps of others. There's a fishbowl in the back. Where you can just put it in there if you want or leave it. I mean, we'll just pick it up. That's one key thing. We have an event coming up again, so we're doing this every month. It's the first Wednesday of every month, same location and so forth. Um, the next one is October 4th over the lunch hour. Um, Dr. Jeff Thompson, he was for a uh, pediatric... A surgeon for Gunderson Lutheran and he was the CEO of Gunderson Lutheran for 16 years and changed the culture. Um, he's drafted a book here and he's on the speaking circuit as well. Live your values, build your people and inspire your community. You can find um, a speech from him in the past on uh, YouTube. And so uh, he's our next speaker and his turnaround's pretty quick. So based on how we had to set up the venue here, we had to do this in this fashion. So it's three weeks away basically is our next one. Um, We'll get that online so you can sign up there. Of course, the headcount is for food-based um, reasons. And bring a friend. You bring someone, it's free. I mean, it's as simple as that. And we're just trying to build this up from there. So anything else? We're done. And we, and it, did we beat the clock? Two minutes ago. All right. See ya.